Hi, it's time for Business Computing Weekly. This is episode number 391, recorded March the 12th, 2013. And we are sponsored by GFI Software, makers of Viper Business Edition Antivirus and Anti-Malware Software and Viper Business Premium Edition. And come to frugalbrothers.com to learn more about GFI Viper. This is really the best antivirus and anti-malware software you could you could get for your organization organization so check it out uh, i want to get right to it we're a little late and i apologize for getting this episode uh, you know up a little bit early and but you are uh, actually hearing me now through our brand new uh, behringer mdx 4600 it's the, actually the multi-pro mdx 4600 this is a noise gate compressor it does a lot of cool stuff with audio and i'm really pleased with it so far now we actually recorded and i gotta apologize to my my co normal co-host jack mclean of mclean's computers uh, we actually recorded uh, this episode sunday night and uh, I, I, my apologies go out to jack because uh, I, even though I, I i monitored the show through my headphones here and everything sounded uh pretty good uh, when I played back the recording, uh, it, my voice was fine, but Jack's voice had a serious echo to it. And uh, unfortunately, that episode just <laughs> was not, uh, I'm not able to, to use it, unfortunately. And rather than ask Jack to re-record, uh, I spent a good amount of time really getting into the nuts and bolts of, of this device and, uh, you know, tweaking it out and, and checking, double-checking and uh and and now i've got it <laughs> nailed down and uh so we're gonna have a, a lot cleaner and a lot better audio and i you know i invested in this equipment i had to actually get a new mixer uh because this noise gate compressor and limiter uh requires that you have what's called a channel insert in your mixer uh and my old mixer didn't have that so i actually bought a new mixer and uh so we got that configured right, and then, but this thing is a beast. This this noise gate compressor limiter. This thing is a beast. I swear, I feel like I'm looking at the cockpit of a, a 737 on here uh, with so much stuff. But uh, the, uh, my wife, who I lovingly call the queen, uh, and I worked with uh, a Skype recording to make sure it was good and clear. And we're not getting any echo and any feedback, and and and, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to tell a, a, a big big difference in the sound quality of uh, this recording uh so my apologies to jack um but uh, you know that 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 kind of happens in broadcasting and sometimes uh, even like i said i was monitoring our conversation the whole time and it sounded you know pretty good as we were recording it uh, through my headphones but when i actually played back the recording um well doggone it not so good so what are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> you know, and, but uh, that's just the way it, I guess it goes. But lesson learned. And uh, so now before we tape, uh, we're going to do a little pre-tape uh, or pre-show taping. And, and I'll just double check to make sure everything's fine before we go into it. But uh, uh, we do have an interview with a, a dear friend of mine, Chris Curry. Uh, he is a uh, IT administrator for a legal professional firm in Brisbane, uh, Australia. And we'll be playing that here in a few minutes into the show. But I, there was a couple things that I wanted to, uh, if I can, if you will indulge me, that I wanted to discuss prior to getting to my interview with Chris. And, and that is, um, and I think this is really a major story. Now, let me just kind of um, begin with uh Close to two years ago, I did a video, a YouTube video, called 10 Reasons Why Windows 8 Will Fail. And this was directed at the, the business community, not so much on the uh, uh, consumer end of things. And that video has received over 60,000 views. There's been, a, I think, like 800-plus comments made. And the, and the comments ran about two to one, agreeing, agreeing with me, uh, every third comment uh, disagreeing with me, and, and that's fine. Um, I feel uh, that a lot of what I said has come to pass. Um, some people have said it was a prophecy. Others still think I'm crazy alone, and, and, and that's fine. 
But you know, uh, the name of this show is Business Computing Weekly. Business. Uh, my channel on YouTube is Frugal Tech, and it is a small business technology channel. So a lot of my comments really are not directed towards home users. They're not directed towards um, casual users or enthusiasts. It's directed uh, with people that through either their direct work or, or indirectly their livelihoods are affected by using computers. And that's not always necessarily an IT professional. Sometimes it's just a small business uh, person out there uh, trying to use these tools to, you know, get further ahead. And I hypothesized that Windows 8 would be a failure uh, due to the, the, the way the whole thing works. Um, this kind of uh, bipolar operating system that tries to be all things to all people. You know the old saying, the jack of all trades, master of none. But a lot of people say, Bruce, you know, you're not, uh, uh, you're not necessarily indicative of the general uh, computing population out there, and, and this thing's going to be a huge success, and here's why, and I'm stupid, and I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I got uh, some validation, and I got it from a, really two sources. And the first one that I want to share with you is recent comments from uh, an executive of a Samsung uh, by the name of uh, I'm probably going to screw this up, but uh, Yun Dong So. Uh, but let's take it for what it's worth. Samsung is a, a you know a major manufacturer out there, and basically what he is saying is that uh, even though the global PC market has been shrinking, uh, the launch of Windows 8 has done nothing uh, to help the sales of Windows PCs. And it is no better than the previous Windows Vista platform. Now, this is a company that sells millions of uh, uh, devices every year. And I think, uh, I think that uh, this speaks volume uh, or volumes about um, uh, the state of Windows 8 in the, uh, in the market in general. Uh, according to the Korea Times, uh, Zhendong So even predicted that the P industry would eventually, or, or gradually, I should say, phase out. But uh, he's really heavily critical of the Windows 8 platform. He says that the Surface tablet is seeing lackluster demand. Uh, RT is a total failure. Um, growth is way down. Windows 8 is just not successful. Uh, I believe that it's time, uh, and, and not only this, this is just, uh, uh, I won't say hearsay, but uh, what I'm about to tell you, <coughs> excuse me, is based on uh, uh, talking to other people, uh, and, and that is uh, that uh, stores like uh, Office Depot, Staples, that kind of thing, or see a f more than their fair share of new uh, PCs equipped with Windows 8 being returned. People are buying these devices and they're returning them because they don't like Windows 8. I, I feel that my original pro my my original YouTube video, ten reasons why Windows 8 will be a failure in the market. Well, it will be a failure or will fail, uh, has been totally validated. Because I'm just a small fry, right? I'm just this one guy sitting out there in his, with all these other million users saying, hey, this thing is going to be a disaster. And uh, But now we've got a major PC manufacturer out here going, it absolutely is a disaster. And this is from a company that, uh, as I said, is a major partner with Microsoft, has done does a lot of sales of Windows and, and that kind of thing. And... They're seeing it, too, that this thing is a total a disaster. And I don't know when Microsoft, if or ever, will admit that this thing is a failure. But it is. By all definitions of the word, Windows 8 is an, a total freaking disaster. But it can be saved. Now, let me, let me just qualify that for just a moment. By disaster, I'm referring to the fact 
that uh, this is clearly uh, an operating system designed for touch-based computers, first and foremost. That's what it's designed for. But when the majority of the people out there don't have Dutch touch-based computers, and furthermore, there's still not that many uh, options out there right now, at the time, and there was hardly anything out there at the time of launch. Now, we're a year into, or, or we're four months into the official launch of Windows 8, and there's still not a lot of choice out there. Most of the lower-end stuff you see out there is non-touch-based machines, and people don't like it because it doesn't work well with it. That's, to me, a recipe for disaster. And businesses are, quite frankly, just saying, no way. I use Windows 7 every day on my, uh, my, my work PC. I've got, a, I've got two computers that I use a lot. Well, really, really three. But uh, one of them is my, uh, uh, what I call my work computer, which uh, is a Dell XPS 8300. And that's what I'm using to record this program with. And is it does a, a really really nice job wearing Windows Seven Professional. My other computer that I use for uh, editing video, uh, all that kind of thing, and, and and one I enjoy really using is a Mac Pro. Okay, I have Windows Eight. I have it in a virtual machine. Not it really not worth fooling with. I even bought a copy of the Windows Eight upgrade and made a bootable USB drive. Uh, for if I decide to use it sometime later. But I'm not going to, folks. I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm a business guy, first and foremost. And I make my money and my livelihood. Um, I sell software for a living. That's what I do. And I sell Windows-based software for a living. That's what I do. And I've talked, and I talk to IT administrators all over the country, folks. All over the bloody country. And... Uh, more, and if I bring up Windows 8 to, uh, to people, when I bring it up, um, I always get the same response. We're not interested. We certainly wouldn't use it. Now, I want to validate this another way. I'm going to bring this website up here. Let me just uh, punch that in here. Maybe you've heard of this guy, Mr. Paul Ferrat. Paul Thorat has been a champion of Windows 8, but I think he finally gets it. Remember when Steve Jobs referred to, uh, remember when he f referred to uh, the PC is going to be like a truck? You know, mobile device is going to be like a car, it's something that everybody uses, and then the PC is going to be a, the truck for heavy duty stuff. Well, Paul Thorat is now finally coming around saying, you know what? saying, number one, if Microsoft is seriously uh, serious about fixing Windows 8 and preventing yet another Vista, sorry, Paul, I think you're too late on that. It's already, the Vista's already gone on. But a full-fledged revolt in exodus to other platforms, he recommends that they bring back uh, Windows NT. Not, not really. What he means is the brand uh, Windows NT. Okay, that brand, if you remember... Uh, back in the day, uh, you had when you had the Windows 95, Windows 98 thing going on, there was also NT 3.5 and NT 4. And your IT pros were using NT because of its stability and that kind of thing. And now they tried to, uh, they tried to kind of merge the two together a little bit, starting with uh, Windows 2000 and, and Windows 2000 Professional. But they really did, Microsoft didn't really get that job done until XP. Okay, but that NT brand, that NT brand is still, according to Paul Thorat, uh, a, a valid uh, way to go, a, a real usable kind of thing. And uh, he says he believes that bringing back the NT brand, uh, you know, basically what he's recommending is a version of Windows without Arrow goes right into the desktop, has all the features that IT professionals and, and business people need. Let them get right to that. Take the best bits of Windows 8 and sell that as NT. And Windows 8, you know, kind of says, so, you know, Windows 8 is a strictly consumer operating system, period. Windows NT is going to be that truck. So Windows 8 is the car. Windows NT is the truck. 
And I kind of like this idea. Of course, I have a lot of respect for Paul. I really do. I don't always agree with the guy, but I read all of his stuff, and, and I listen to him on Windows Weekly, and uh, I think this makes a lot of sense. Now, say what you will about the NT brand, but it's definitely associated with a very high-quality, very robust, very sturdy operating system. And I think maybe that does make sense. But I wanted to share that with you. I feel totally validated uh, to say that in its current form, Windows 8 is an abject failure. Uh, it's not selling well out there. People are buying, they're buying Windows 8 uh, devices and they're returning them. Windows Phone 8 is also a failure in the marketplace. It never had a whole lot of market share to begin with and over the holidays has lost market share. It's just not going anywhere, uh, folks. But it's not too late for Microsoft to turn things around. But the business community is going to stick with Windows 7 and they're not going to move in any real measurable way Windows 8 and uh, I just wanted to talk about it. if you hate what I have to say that's fine I'm very open-minded but prove to me how Windows 8 is successful in any measurable way and you cannot come to me and say well they sold 60 million licenses well that doesn't mean that there are 60 million users out there using it, it just means that yeah, they they have pre-sold a lot of license to manufacturers who are now scrambling to figure out how to get rid of these things. But what you don't see is people clamoring to get Windows 8 devices. Some of your Microsoft diehards, yes, but um, for the most part, no joy. Now, as uh, let's move along. We will be back next Sunday. We're going to do another recording with Jack McLean and. Uh, there's a lot of topics we wanted to get to, and, and, and we did get to in that episode that, unfortunately, we can't get to uh, now. Uh, one other thing I want to share with you before we get to uh, our interview with Chris is that uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, as a side project, will be uh, bringing out a brand new show. It's called The Queen and I, and it's going to be on YouTube and we're also going to make it into an audio podcast, and we've started a new website called uh, cfpn.tv and that stands for career and family podcast network.tv and uh, the first episode we're going to record next saturday and uh, release it um, uh, next sunday the first episode of the queen and i and it is not really about tech it's about a, a married couple sitting around talking about family and career and technology and just a little bit of everything. Maybe it's kind of like Seinfeld. <laughs> it's a show about absolutely nothing at all, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. And uh, it's a radical departure for us, but it's a, a fun project that we're both working on. We hope that you check out the premiere of The Queen and I. It'll be uh, uploaded and available uh, uh, next Sunday. And uh, so let me just uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about my interview with Chris Curry. Um, I had uh, posted a a tweet about cloud security because what I do every day now is I look for great stories or that I think people that are interested in network and IT security would be interested and I tweet those out and uh, me and Chris have been friends for a number of years now and he's a character this guy's a real card he's very 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 funny guy uh, but he's also very very serious and very passionate about certain things and he came back to me and goes uh, and I'm not going to try to imitate his Australian accent, but uh, uh, he came back to say, I want to talk to you about this on Business Computing Weekly. I have some legitimate concerns about cloud security. And I said, okay, Chris, uh, sure, why not? So um, it was you know, kind of late in the evening, and uh, I just went ahead, and we started you know, talking about his concerns, and we recorded that. He's in uh, Brisbane, uh, Australia, and uh, he worked for a law firm, a law practice over there. I think maybe 50 to 80 person organization. So it's you know, a decent sized law firm. And uh, well, let me go ahead and uh, cue that up for you and, and, and play that for you. And uh, then we'll, we'll end the show on that with that interview. So uh, thanks for uh, uh, watching this show and enjoy the interview with Mr. Chris Curry, IT administrator. Um, talking about cloud cons uh, cloud security and his concerns uh, about the security and safety of your data. 
Uh, joining me this evening is Chris Curry. He is an IT administrator for a smaller enterprise, actually not too small, in uh, Brisbane, uh, Australia. And uh, Chris is a, uh, uh, as I said, the network administrator, and he's got some thoughts that he wanted to share with us about uh, network, uh, well, I should say cloud security. This seems to be a concern to Chris. So let me just bring him on the screen here. Hey, Chris, how are you doing this evening? Not too bad, Bruce. This is kind of strange having to say hello again. Yeah, it is kind of, well, of course, we've already been through <laughs> <laughs> setting up, but uh, uh, me and Chris go back a number of years, and uh, we've uh, we've done some uh, uh, netcast together before in different shows, and uh, but Chris, uh, actually, uh, his day-to-day -day job is administrating a network for a professional organization. We won't go into specific details about the company, uh, but can you give us kind of an idea, Chris, about how many users are on the network that you have right now? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it'd be like a, a small to medium size at the moment. There's only about, say, uh, 70 to 80. So it's relatively small medium oh yeah so that would fall typically under the description of a small business now i had posted on twitter a link to an article about cloud security and uh you kind of shared some of your thoughts with those with me privately and, and said okay let's talk about this on business computing weekly so this is your opportunity to kind of tell our audience what your uh your thoughts are on cloud security right now why why is it a bad idea well, there's there's a few things in that because uh, it's it's hard to understand. You've got at the moment a real peak of people uh, going around. Um, you've got Bob and Joe's cloud computing businesses and stuff like that just springing up left, right, and center, offering you know all these all this hundred percent uptime guarantees. This, that, and the other. You know, we'll look after your exchange. We'll look after your file servers. All this, that, and the other. Um, but my main concerns are is, um, you know, you, you can't trust these companies because, I mean, we had a look at going with um, Office 365 uh, with our with our, uh, right. our business. We decided we decided not to go with Office 365, but that's a whole different story. But really, I, know, I thought you were uh, you were into that in a big big way. I I am I if, I. My job is to basically sit there and say to the company, "These are my recommend. Like these, these are five different ways we can go forward, and just recommend um, the best solution that I think of." Okay. But uh, we've chosen to go. We've cho chosen to go in house still, so um, we're going to keep running our own exchange server for the time being. Um, but um. The yeah the the big thing with the with the cloud computing at the moment is um, you don't know where your data is stored. Okay. And and not knowing where your data is stored. I mean, I, myself, say for say for example, being being us being a, a professional service, um, little tiny little bit more information, uh, law. Okay. Um, you know, you could be. You know your your clients, or you know your your, uh, well, your clients. I'm sure I'm sure they wouldn't want their data being you know in private details held in say uh, uh, Istanbul, you know Russia, China, all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the biggest things. Well, you know, as I understand it, um, many countries have laws or regulations that say that. Uh, data can only be hosted either internally in that country or within specifically allowed countries. You know, especially Europe has a number of laws uh, on that. You know, if you were, say, you had a business in Germany, uh, you may or may not be able allowed to host your data on a server, say, in the USA, for example. Or you may not be able to host it, say, in South Korea, if you're in, in Germany, or et cetera. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, Australia has similar laws on the books as well. Yeah, yeah. Like say, say the the, the field that we're in, um, we cannot hold client data offshore. 
or certain client details or data um, interstate. You have to keep certain uh, you know certain amounts of data within within the state mm -hmm. or within the country. But we cannot um, if we, if we go out uh, if we go into state, we would have to sit there and then go to the uh, you know go to a specialist like a special group like a. a Law society and say, hey, we're thinking about hosting a data in Sydney. Blah blah blah. This is this is what they've got. Then you know, is this fine? Um, so yeah, we've got we've got all those laws. Well, and, and uh, it, this is not unique. Okay, just because uh, Chris is in Australia, these rules kind of follow around on on a global basis. Now, Chris, if I recall, you hold a number of certifications. Um, particularly dealing with data security. Is that correct? Uh, 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 kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, okay. I've, pretty much, I've pretty much got like your typical kind of, you know, your, your Microsoft certifications, Cisco and that, and a few, uh, couple of security ones. Max, we're about to finish. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, like, but this is something you, you kind of do day in and day out for a living. But So to, to hear you correctly, you're, is your concern that a, a, a cloud hosting company may go out of business, leaving you high and dry with the data? Or, I mean, can, can you be a little bit more specific about what your chief concerns are? Because I, I tell you, uh, we're being pushed daily, and I mean daily. Uh, we just see more and more applications being moved to uh, the web. Uh, you know, we see, um, you know, everything from accounting to sales to uh, email to, uh, file storage, uh, everything's being pushed up to the web. And uh, so, but, you know, there is a downshot that uh, some of these companies do not go out of their way to uh, make clear. And, but I, and I constantly see people will say, um, I don't trust the cloud. I want my data on premises where I know it's safe and I, I don't, I don't, and I don't, I don't trust these guys, but, uh, yet you have companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon, uh, Rackspace and others that are out there saying, you know, look, we, we comply to all these various security standards. You know, we have military grade security. What, what more can we do to make you comfortable with what's going on? And I don't think we'd have to worry about Google or Microsoft suddenly going out of business. I wouldn't think. No, I mean like Google, Microsoft, all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't have an issue hosting with them at all because Unless there's something like in the way of Enron style, <laughs> you know, they're not going away overnight. Right. So, um, but uh, say for example, yeah, you've got you've got Bob's co uh, uh, Bob's cloud computing company. He like you know, I've I've been approached on a day in day out basis at work. I'm I, I receive phone calls. Oh, let us host your exchange. Let us host your file server. Let us host your and the the big issue there for me is, you know. Bob's Cloud Computing over here, if we go with them, and say they go uh, bankrupt, bust, or anything like that, um, or, you know, say, you know, it turns into kind of like a mega upload style where, you know, authorities come in and seize the hardware, well, what's that going to do for your business? You know, you're going to be stuck there. You're going to incur a, a large amount of costs. I mean, it, it's great for a company to turn around and say, "Hey, you know, we we host your data on four different in in four different data centers, but um, it's still the same company. If the company goes bust or if the company gets seized, um, you know, your data is gone. So what what happens then? What you know? I, but my question then, Chris, I, I don't really know." of too many people that really host in any significant way anything with, you know, Bob's cloud service. Um, at least I'm not aware of. It looks like uh, most of the companies that are in this business are fairly substantial players. There's, there is a lot of, you, you'll most probably find it's pretty big over here in Australia. You get a lot of managed services companies, the guys that come in okay. and offer to outsource the help desk and all this, that, the other. Mm -hmm. They'll come in and they'll they'll offer you all these kinds of things. And then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you know your data's being hosted with them. Yeah, they are 99% of the time telling the truth. Yeah, it's being hosted where it is. But 
still my main concern is is that com- that company goes out of business or something happens overnight, you know, your data's still with them. You've got nothing on site, you know. Now, say for example, like so, basically, you would want you would want your data in the cloud, but then replicate back to back to being on site. So, right. Because okay. the other the other part the other part as well is you ha- you have a look at it. So you could have backups going back on going back to site. But say for example they do go out of business. Now you've just got backups, but you've got no infrastructure. So you've got like say you might not have any servers or anything like that. So you know uh, I know over here to um, especially with our suppliers and stuff like that. You know you want to grab a couple of IBM servers and that because you need to reinstall ESX and also get a SAN with all the hard, you know, and throw all the hard drives in the SAN so you can get all your servers back up and running. You know, this isn't kind of like a, this isn't the kind of thing where you can just run down to your local, like, you know, computer store and say, hey, you know, I need I need a server and a SAN and this amount of hard drives kind of thing. Oh, and a switch and, oh, I need, you know, yeah, it's, you're going to have a huge amount of downtime. Yeah, I guess the way I, I look at it, uh, and, and I and I get your point, and I think you make a val- valid point. Uh, I don't, there are a lot of managed service providers uh, here in the States. I mean, there's a ton. And um, and for obvious reasons, the broke fix IT bi- business model wasn't making it for a lot of folks. Uh, I and I, But I, well, here's what I see. I see a, a lot of these companies actually reselling uh, or private, what we call white label or private labeling, a larger company's service, say for cloud-based backup, okay? It's, it's not really that they're, they've got their own data center. Some do. Uh, I'm not saying that there's not. But I'm saying a number of them actually just private label another company's or a larger company's uh, uh, product and, and resell as part of a package as a managed service provider. Okay. That being said, um, when we talk uh, and when we talk about uh, hosted data, we're not necessarily referring to email like Office 365 or, or Google Apps for for email. I mean, maybe there's some uh, that may put in that category, but we're talking more like your 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 client data, your, maybe your accounting, your uh, uh, maybe your personnel files, HR. Uh, this yep. more critical kind of stuff and keeping in the cloud, and, and that concerns you, though, correct? I mean, that's that. Yeah. But your concern is more, and, and what I've really heard from you is your concern is based more on a smaller company going out of business, and you can't get to your data, and you're kind of screwed at that point. Is, is that in a nutshell? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I and I think that's a valid, uh, valid case. So the solution to that. It would be um, uh, before you do a contract with a company like that. Would be to have a real good handle on their financial situation, wouldn't you think? Yeah, it, I it, mean, it when you do some di- due diligence of some kind uh, as an IT administrator, if you're considering a cloud partner, um, wouldn't you want to do, include in your due diligence some type of analysis of the kind of shape that company is in? Yes, and, yeah, and that's very course, difficult that's to do in a privately held company. By the way, that I mean, if it's privately held, that's really difficult to do because you're probably not going to get real accurate numbers. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, fair enough, um, but you can't go into any detail why your company did not go with Office 365. Uh, no, not can, can really. Just a hint. Is, is uh, it a management thing or? It's um, being. Uh, it's still very in, in a lot of people that I've spoken to, and a lot of um, uh, a lot of other um, there's quite a few other law firms that uh, that um, have turned around and said, you know, when it's a bit of a well, yeah. In a nutshell, it's a bit of a grey area. Is it? Uh, are you? A, you know, you can put it up there, but then. Uh, you, you can go with go with the three six five, but then um, our law states that the information should actually be over here. So if you had client, like say an attachment with all the client details and information, and it's hosted in 
play like I think the three six five servers for Australia and Hong Kong and yeah, Sing yeah, Singapore, Hong Kong. And um yeah, so that's a bit of a grey area. That it's kind of uh, from my understanding, it's kind of frowned upon to have it hosted off site. So it's a bit of a grey area. No one can literally like yeah, well, no one can actually say yeah, you can do it off, you know, you can go on 365. No, I, I get off. the whole gray area thing because um, laws are written in such a way that they're open to interpretation. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and the hard thing is, right. And, and especially being, being uh, uh, our law firm, it's even harder, even, you know, with, with all these lawyers, even for us to have a look through all this, you know, no, no, have a look through it. It's hard. It really so, so like, the idea is, is that you become so uh, intertwined or intertwined with the details that it's better to make no decision and, and, or a decision to the negative rather than to proceed, just in case we might be wrong somewhere down the road. Yes. So you're going to because stick with an in-house exchange server, is what you're saying? Just, just for the time being, until we okay make a few more changes and stuff. We are, uh, I am currently looking at things in the way of um, uh, backing up but, to uh, the cloud. But here, here vice I, versa. Let, let me beg this, uh, uh, let me ask you this question. So this is something I firmly believe. I believe that the on-premise version of Exchange Server will go away within the next yeah, five years or so, for the most part. I really don't think, I think Microsoft's going to pull the plug on uh, on-premise versions of Exchange. Now, maybe they might have like an enterprise version for, you know, a huge company, but small shops uh, would be would be prohibitively expensive. So I think that's, I don't, I, I don't see where that's not going to be a choice in the next four or five years anyway. It's going to have to be, if you want email, for your domain, you're going to have to get in a host of service. You will not be able to buy a version of Exchange to run uh, on premise. It just won't happen. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I did. I mean, you see the, the small, medium sized business, easy, you know, what is it, five bucks, 10 bucks, 15 bucks a month, like depending on the package that you choose, um, you know, for 365, or even you can go, you know, with. Google, like with the Gmail, like you know, the, I believe was it the business Google. Well, like you the, know, that's I, I and I'm a big Google Apps fan. Okay, I, I, I truly am a big Google Apps. In fact, I've been I was running my shop off of Google Apps up until just a couple months ago when I made the switch to Office 365. However, when you look at the wins, the 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 people that really go with Google Apps for the most part, uh. At least what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a lot of non-for-profits, a lot of schools, a lot of startups uh, that go with Google Apps. Uh, and I don't think it's, it's, Chris, I don't think it's fair to compare, because basically they give the product away for free to schools, universities, and uh, non-for-profits. So it's, it's really, of course these uh, organizations are going to flock to uh, the ability to get this stuff for free. But when it comes to people's really got honest to God work to do and business to get done, I, I think their comfort level, good, bad, or indifferent, is still with uh, Microsoft Office and Outlook and Exchange and all that sort of thing. Oh, definitely. No, I mean, um, I personally, not in a in professional services, definitely wouldn't. You know, I, I mean, that you you would not you would like, not risk your job on uh, Google Apps. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and not only that, but this just goes back to, you know, as I was saying, like, ho like you know, well, with the hosting, like in the cloud kind of thing, where is your emails when it comes to Google? Which server are you on? What? Like, where is it? Yeah, you're, <laughs> so, you're, you're all over the map. Yeah. So, um, I mean, definitely, I, I reckon, I, 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 I really think I strongly agree that, um, yeah, small, medium-sized business, 365 will be pushed um, and um, yeah, for the for the big enterprises and companies along those lines um, if they want to have in-house exchange yeah, there you go enterprise licensing or a different style and, and but the point is is at the end of the day 
your business will be running on the cloud. Yes. Okay. I, I, cause I know people, uh, I know people who own software companies and they're get they're good sized multinational software companies. Uh, and I'm dealing with a fellow in Germany. Uh, I'm dealing, uh, with folks, uh, in Malta, <laughs> Uh, and they, they say the same things. Number one, there's a couple of things. Number one, the price of software must come down. The price of in order to do that, you've got to uh, you've got to uh, have it hosted. You, you've got to have it hosted, and this is the what we're writing code for now. And we're doing everything going to be moving forward. We're going to put everything onto the web, and that's the way it's going to be. And, you know, if you guys want to hang on to still running XP in Office 2003, five years from now, God love you, but the world is going to move around you. Okay. And so you guys are going to have to figure out your laws. It's either adapt or die. And that's just how the big software houses are looking at it. Uh, definitely. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, the day, the day when I can basically go to, say, you know, if I could go to Microsoft and say, hey, look, Office 365, are we allowed to use that um, if, you know, and then they say yes, and then I'll go over here and I ask the, uh, I guess you'd, you'd call it the governing body for the law in the state, and I say to them, look, Microsoft say we're allowed to, uh, allowed to host with this, this is okay with these guys. If they come back and say, yeah, sure, not a problem, you know, just make sure you don't do this, this, and this, which they normally do, right. always have a few couple of, couple of things. Don't really have an issue there, but yeah, it's more so the um, yeah. My main concern is is uh, more so the the more cowboy types that um, are trying to make a make a buck or two off this cloud word. Okay, I, I think that was a a a a fair and valid argument. I and I think uh, I think especially if you're dealing with managed service providers who are offering the service of hosting data, whether it's your uh, backups of critical data or if they're hosting certain applications that you depend on, uh, I think that bears a second look. I, I guess where I'm at with it right now at, uh, at, at Sing Stand is that I think that the cloud uh, email is fine, um, whether you're doing Google Apps for the most part or whether you're doing... Uh, Office 365, um, I think that's fine. But uh, I think that uh, right now, maybe backing up certain data to the cloud, uh, maybe using the Amazon S3 service, something like that that's encrypted, and you have a private key and, and uh, lots of good authentication. I've, I feel quite comfortable with that. But make sure that you have copies of your data on-premise. So I kind of look at this way. You have local backups and then backups of the backups to the cloud. And for just, app, you know, and I think if there's applications that you can only get on the cloud for your business, well, so be it. But be careful, I, I, I guess, is uh, it's kind of, a, I think we're in a hybrid kind of world right now. We're a combination of on-premise and the cloud. To be total cloud, I think right now is kind of, uh, totally foolish. And even though there's a lot of apps I recommend to people cloud-based, um, you know, things like uh, join.me or join me and, you know, Podio and uh, Podio and, and all these, at the end of the day, you still need to have access to your data. And, 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 and part of us I hear is just common sense, Chris. Uh, don't host with Bob's hostings. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. No, no. It's no, no offense yeah, to Bob. I, he might be a great guy and as honest as a day come, as long, but uh, you can't afford to let something put you out of business either. Exactly, because um, yeah, and, and the only reason why I bring up the like, say, the Bob's hosting company and that is because they're just, as I said, day in day out, I get companies calling me up, saying, you know, with the whole spiel. We have four data centers. Your data will be backed up of all four data centers and that. And but yet there's, yeah, it, it's just one of those things. You kind of sit there and there's things that raise, raise you know, raise your eyebrows and kind of go, you know, I don't know about this. <laughs> well, fair enough. 
Miss Chris Curry, thank you for coming on and getting that point across for us this evening. That's all right. All thank right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.